If only I owned my data. I'm Catherine, and I'm really into privacy. Hey, everybody. I'm Nimisha, and I'm really into architecture. So today, Catherine and I are combining forces. We're going to talk about privacy first architecture. So join us as we architect decentralized data systems. What if the user was actually at the center of our architecture? Here's Alicia, and she'll be our example user today. If Alicia is at the center, she can choose what hardware she buys, whether it's a connected fridge, a laptop, a dedicated server. She makes those choices herself. And what if Alicia makes her own decisions of where she stores her data? For certain devices, she may choose to short store her data locally on the device. In other cases, she may want to actually back up her data into, a, let's say, a cloud storage provider, right? especially if the device is unreliable. In other cases, she might want to choose an external storage of her choice. And if Alicia is making their choices for their data storage, they're also able to make their choices on what applications they use, because these applications are now separate from storage choices. They could even potentially make different application feature choices across multiple applications to serve a single purpose. And since the storage of the data is in her hands, she has control of the access to her data. So what if, while the storage cloud provider may be storing her data, the access to the underlying clear text of her data is not in the cloud provider's hands? And what if the application service providers, while they might need to access her data, they don't actually control access to her data? She can easily change her secrets, she can easily change her secrets. She can easily change um, the data itself because it's in her control. And this means that if Alicia has all of these options, what if Alicia could also control their machine learning? What if Alicia could compare machine learning services and models and determine how they would actually like to contribute data to algorithms or not? And finally, what if Alicia chooses her own identity provider? Not an identity provider that an application service decided to choose for her, or not an identity provider that a device vendor chose. It's actually an identity provider that she chose for herself, one that she trusts, one that she believes will protect her identity, vouch for who she is and protect her personally identifiable information as well. Then, when Alicia's identity changes in any shape and form, whether she changes her name, her gender, her credentials, that's the relationship between Alicia and her identity provider. She doesn't need to go and update her identity in all of the multiple applications she uses and all the devices and storage, right? How many of you here have needed to change your identity or know someone who had needed to change your identity in any shape or form? I mean, isn't it a pain? Your identity is just broken up throughout the internet today. And then, when an application service provider goes out of business, Alicia doesn't have to fear that their data is going to be lost or even sold off to another company. Alicia can take their data with them because they already control the storage of the data themselves. And also, this means that when they make decisions to change their data storage location, whether it be a cloud backend, a different type of backup, a storage provider, they can also move that data themselves. And when data is particularly sensitive, for example, photos of their children or other sensitive personal documents, they can choose a storage provider or a storage solution that works for them 
and grant specific access to those storage servers or storage locations to family, friends, and others who they might want to share that with. Catherine, I think I'm hearing people wondering, well, this all looks, sounds kind of great, but I mean, is this even possible? It's just not where we are today. Definitely not. <laughs> but Catherine and I are here to tell you, we've done it. In fact, in the late 90s, oh man, <laughs> the vibes in the room are saying, yes, we can do it. <laughs> I mean, in the late 90s, I was part of a team that was building a peer-to-peer -peer application called Groove, okay? And in retro style, in black and white on the left here, you'll see like a faint imagery of a past Groove user interface. There we had shared Groove spa uh, spaces where groups of users would come together, we would have discussions, we would share messages, we would share files, and so forth. And mind you, there were no centralized servers at all in the picture. In fact, if you wanted to authenticate another user, if I wanted to authenticate Catherine, I would, on Groove, I would call her up and say, out of band, hey, Catherine, what's your Groove fingerprint? And a fingerprint being, you know, a hash of her public key on a Groove, for her Groove identity. And, you know, if I don't want to do that, and it's a relationship that I built on Groove itself and no Catherine out of band, then I might do the tofu style of authentication, right? Or the trust on first use. So there, you know, as you build relationships online, you're able to then alias and put your own nickname for other users on Groove as a result, uh, so that you start associating an identifier, a name, with a person's public key. Now, the public sector also found Groove to be pretty powerful. So we, it was used in the Iraqi war for uh, humanitarian needs, to be able to assess the humanitarian needs of people affected by the war. And because Groove was all peer-to-peer -peer and there was no centralized server that was needed, it, it allowed people to use our application when the network connectivity was unreliable and the infrastructure was, was not something that you could trust. It was also used in peace negotiations when, between Sri Lanka and the Tamil Tiber, Tiger rebels. For them, they did not have a mutually trusting relationship at all. They didn't trust the other side to run a server. They, couldn't, they didn't even want to cross-certify each other. That's how you know, politically sensitive the situation was. So then they decided, okay, Let's use, use Groove because of its peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. Now, if we were to diagram Groove's architecture using the modeling elements that we showed earlier, we would depict the users in the center, right? I mean, each user is a peer to another user, and each user runs the Groove application on their own devices using whatever storage mechanism that user wanted to choose and each user has their own Groove identity. And any local access to the data, the data was encrypted at rest, at rest you know, using the user's own uh, keys specifically for themselves. And then, whenever there was any sharing of data or messages from one peer to another peer, these were all automatically encrypted over the wire. We automatically generated pairwise keys using Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocols. And if there were any group messages, right, we had a shared group, uh, shared group uh, keys, that, secret keys that we also generated. And it was, those keys were automatically rekeyed and regenerated, redistributed whenever new members joined or members uh, left the group. So essentially what we did was we were enabling full end-to-end -end encryption of um, messages and data over the wire. In the end, where was the data kept in clear text? Only on the user's own machines. Now, yes, we did leverage servers, right? However, those servers were not core to the architecture. They were additive, 
And we used them in certain cases um, whenever there were some special circumstances. So they were ephemeral to the core architecture. So for example, you know, here in the, you know, in the bottom, you'll see the, the storage, uh, the cloud, uh, you know, for the data that was stored in the cloud. And what we, th th those are what we called relay servers. And the relay servers, they came into time, you know, just temporarily. So for instance, as a peer, let's say I want to send a message to Catherine, I might be able to, I, I could put in my own profile information about what relay server Catherine can use in case she wants to send a message while I'm offline. So Catherine can look at my profile and say, okay, I want to send a message to Nimisha, but she's offline, so let me send it to her relay server. The relay server, for me, would be temporarily storing that data, just temporarily, so when I come back on, online, I can go and grab it, and then that data is off of that server. And remember, everything's end-to-end -end encrypted, so the relay server has no access to my underlying data or to our messages either. And similarly, on the top left there, you'll see the identity provider also being used. Now that too was an identity provider, you can say it was a server, but that was also additive. If as a, as a user, I wanted to have a certificate authority vouch additionally for my identity, fine, I could leverage it. But my true identity, who I was, was still something that I controlled um, and my primary key would still be my groove identity. Namisha, I don't think that's how things work today. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> Catherine. I'm pretty sure we moved a little bit away from that. All right. So what do we have today? I mean, today we kind of have a bunch of these services that are built into either a cloud provider, sometimes even a hardware provider and sometimes some combination of cloud software and hardware. And a lot of these are extremely entangled in the sense that sometimes even we have competing identity services in a particular application or in a particular cloud provider, right? We have extremely complex systems here. And a lot of times it really depends on what hardware you choose. It's not even up to the user. If you want that connected fridge, you're going with that cloud provider and you're going with that application provider and that's it, that's your choice, right? So really here, Alicia, our user, is not even at the center. In fact, the user, when we really look at how things work today, it's almost like the user is an afterthought in the entire design. Yep, that's right. And you know what? It's even worse than that. I mean, if you look inside any of our silos today, it's not as ni neatly compartmentalized as we see on the left, right? It's not like we have each of these things. No, it looks a, li a lot more like the right, where things are, uh, all these dimensions are tightly coupled together. In fact, Rich Hickey, who is the author of Closure, he says, this is where complexity comes from. Complecting. He said it's simple. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> don't interleave. Don't entwine. Don't braid. It's best to just avoid it in the first place. Now, when you've built a system that's complex, it's really hard to then expand on it and innovate further. Instead, what he says is find those individual components, those that then can be composed and placed together to build more robust software. And we can take Rich's design principles and ideas here, apply it not just to a single programming language like Clojure, you know, not, also not just to software application design, but also to enterprise architecture. And yes, even industry-wide architecture. Now, how do we actually find out what those individual pieces of components could be that we can compose? For that, let's see what Pablo Picasso and Steve Jobs have to say. Now, in the mid-1940s, then Pablo Picasso, there was a period of time for four months where he was working about 12 hours every day, and he was building, he was creating these series of lithographic prints. Here, we're showing one of those prints of the bull. 
And you'll see right on the top left where he starts where the bull is very artistically rendered with artfully shading and um, detail work. But he won't, goes through this effort where he tries to distill it to its most essential components. What does he boil it down to? Just 12 lines, 12 lines, where the horn is just a shape of a U. U for the horn, a little line there, suggestive of the tail at the end of the bull, and then these black and white, the dots, that evoke the skin of the bull. Now, it was not a, it's not an easy task, right? Pablo Picasso worked really hard on that, and he, but he simplifies it. And Steve Jobs, he says that it takes a lot of hard work to make something simple. You really got to truly understand it to do that. That's what Picasso had done, and that's how Steve Jobs designs. In fact, when um, Apple hires their uh, new employees, by the way, they present to them uh, this Pablo Picasso uh, bull uh, uh, prints as well to, to really try to teach at a larger scale in the company you know, what simple and good design could look like. And this is why from Apple, right, we see things such as the simplicity of their mouse design and their Apple TV remote and their iMac and so forth. Okay. So after that segue, let's bring it back to the topic of today, which is let's take these design principles, right, and think about rediscovering the essence, disentangle our systems of today so that we can recompose them. But this time when we recompose them, what are we going to do? We're going to put the user as the new center. Now, Catherine, remind me, what were those essential components that we were looking at? I think it looks like this. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what we're dealing with. Okay, so if, if here's the complected, complex, and overly coupled systems that we have today, what happens if we pull out identity and we try to actually decouple and decomplect identity? What happens when we take the essence of identity and we make it actually composable? And we make it not composable for us as the software providers, but we instead make it composable for the user. What this could mean is that the user can actually choose a series of trusted identity providers that they use. And in choosing the identity providers that they use, whether they be hardware-based, or whether they be software-based, whether they be federated, or whether they be decentralized, the user is now in charge of their own identity, which means they no longer have to deal with email password combinations strewn across the web to authenticate them, and that therefore, with every breach, brings them closer to danger. How might this actually look? Well, here we have my version of Picasso. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. And what we have here is potentially how Alicia would like to identify. So Alicia wants to use Keybase IO because they want to use an encrypted backend service to identify themselves. And they may also want to choose advanced sharing settings. They may want to say exactly what information or what pieces of my identity or my credentials via the service are allowed to be shared and which ones are not. And in fact, we can take it a step further. When we take decentralized identity at its core, we can also think about cryptographic proofs of information. And so why should I have to give my email address if I can prove that I own my email address? Why should I have to give my phone number if I can prove that I can receive calls or texts there? Why should I have to prove my age at all if I can prove, for example, cryptographically without ever revealing my age or my birth date in plain text, if I can cryptographically prove that I'm, say, above 18 or above 21? There's absolutely no reason for us to exchange so much information, especially private information about us, when there's just better ways. How does it look for applications? 
well, that sounds really exciting for identity. We can do the same thing for applications, right? Let's, let's, let's Picasso it up and we're going to um, tease apart the application services, right, out of our tightly coupled silos. Soon as we decouple that, that allows us to then think about, okay, what if we now were to recompose it with the user at the center? Now the user is at the center. The user has control over those applications, right? Here, Alicia, she gets to decide which application she uses and when and to what extent. And she can make her own decision. So this means, for example, if the photo application that she was using decides to go out of business, Alicia's photos still remain with her. So she still controls it. Right? And if she wanted to go and choose another photo app, still her photos remain with her. In fact, she's allowed to now experiment and try a bunch of different photo apps and move from one photo app to another photo app seamlessly, while the whole time her, pho her photos remain with her. They're not tightly coupled with the photo app and, and um, siloed there. As another example, what if she wanted to use a messaging app that she chose for herself? And she wants to collaborate with others. She doesn't need to conform to the same messaging app that, let's say, her friend circle or her community, her organizations are, cho are using, choosing to use. This gets a little bit difficult to imagine because we're just not there today um, in our industry. But how could this actually work, right? For decentralized applications like this to work, you need standards. And if all of these messaging apps were communicating with each other with interoperable standards, then it doesn't matter. We don't all have to conform to the same messaging app. It's the standards that allow us to interoperate. It's the standards that allow us to be portable. It's the, it's the standards that allow us to substitute one app for another. And it doesn't then take a charismatic individual to need to convince everybody, hey, let's use this messaging app. And it doesn't have to therefore be the powerful marketing engine of one company saying, hey, everyone, let's use this messaging app. The messages and the data for, the, for Alicia here, she controls and she chooses. At the end of the day, right, it's Alicia and her experiences. The applications are there to serve her not the other way around. Another example, right, might be, definitely it's very uh, <laughs> um, relevant for myself right now, because as a consultant and working with different organizations and <clears throat> different calendars, curious out of this group as well, how many of you have two or more calendars that you need to manage today? <clears throat> oh my gosh. <clears throat> Almost everybody I feel here, it seemed. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, no? It's, it's your day. It's your single 24 hours day. And just because your organizations or your communities are choosing different calendars, why is it that your single day is broken up into all of these different calendar silos? Well, if the calendar app were truly decentralized, right, it wouldn't matter what other app choices others had made. Right At the end of the day, Alicia here, she would have a single view of her day. She then would allow her app through a standard mechanism to access her day, right? And whichever people that she gives access to, to her day, they would use standards with their, using their own calendar app to be able to see and um, access her calendar. Folks, in the end, we each would retain independent freedom of our own choices. And while, you know, especially with our calendar apps, and we'll still be able to find time to meet each other. So that was all about decoupling and decentralizing application services. Now we're gonna move on into data. So let's try to now decouple the data aspects of it. And when we do that, we'll see there's actually multiple aspects of data. There's data storage, 
there's data access, and then there's machine learning. Now, once they're decoupled, let's see what would happen if we were to decentralize them. So here, too, remember, Alicia's at the center. She can decide which storage mechanism and provider suits her needs, her requirements, her trust. Now she has a, also a lot more control. The key here talking up on top, talk, re, representing the control and the, and the access. She has control over who has access, you know, which users, which application providers. She has control about what type of access, how granular she wants the access to be. Fine-grained, coarse-grained, it becomes part of her control, not somebody else's choice. And she also can decide when to give access. It could be temporary access, right? It could be whenever she wants to, she can turn on and off the access as she, w as she wishes. So, and on the bottom, you'll see talking about uh, d depicting the machine learning aspect, the personalization. So she has more control of her own data now, she can decide how she wants to actually leverage it for, for her own personalization needs. And the backpack there is representing the portability, right? So finally, that the data is now decoupled. If she chooses to change her mind at any given point in time, she can do so, and the portability will allow her to do that. And exactly, and if we take a look at this interface, I mean, I think if you ask your users, or if you even ask yourself when you design it, do users actually know where their data is being stored? Do users know how it's being replicated? Do users get to approve how their data is going to be used? Do they get to decide when that usage ends or when the access is expired? These are all things that are, should be in the hands of the users, but today are not. And that also goes with access. So when we grant access today, we assume that access means lifelong access for our use of that application. But that actually doesn't have to be the case. In fact, due to a variety of regulatory requirements, access should be restricted within 18 months or less for many types of data that we control. So we could imagine an interface where we give access to a calendar app and we expire access after a certain amount of days. Will we talk about how the calendar app is going to use the data and allow the users to have fine-grained control over a variety of use cases? And finally, will we actually think through how we want to share private information from something like a mobile or handheld device? Currently, how many of you have gotten spammed or an invitation because a friend of yours signed up for a service and it automatically went through their contact list and it tried to sign you up, right? This is supremely annoying. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's actually a cryptographic technique called private set intersection, or PSI, that allows us to find joins without revealing any of the plain text. So if the goal of the application is to find other people you know on that service, this could actually be done with PSI in a safe mechanism for all of the people in your address book, as well as for you yourself. This could only show then the matches of other people that have signed up for the service, and maybe even other people who have opted in to allow auto find of them on that service. This would be a privacy first design for access to data. And on the user access side, if you could go back. Sorry. On the user access side, I could grant access to individual users or groups of users with a fairly limited time window. Yes. For example, if I'm trying to meet with people at Strange Loop, I could set an expiration of three days. 
I don't know of any application that allows me to set this type of expiration for access today except for one-time use, which is also great to have, and expiring messages at one-time use codes are great, but it doesn't solve the entire problem. Mm -hmm. And with that, I could also give a variety of granularity access to my data, like busy available versus seeing the full details, or allowing people to use scheduling algorithms with my calendar or deciding, no, I'd rather opt out of that. These are all choices that we can give to the users today should we design things in a decentralized and user-first way. And it doesn't stop there. I work in the field of machine learning, and I'm not sure how many people here have already heard of federated learning. A few. So federated learning is the ability for us to learn on edge devices or on non-centralized compute. So we can keep the data on edge devices, here a series of mobile phones, without actually transferring the data itself. We do transfer some data. That data leaks information. So this is not by default privacy first without thinking through also the information that leaks with the very small amount of data that we transfer. However, this at least allows users to control and opt in to different things like machine learning training rounds, and this could also provide more competition in the machine learning space. Because here at the center, we could have a new model provider or a machine learning provider. They could say, hey, do you want to have a collaborative model? This is the type of user group that we're choosing to build it. Do you want to opt into the training rounds? And at any point in time, you could decide to opt out and stop your model updates at that point in time. And you could choose to decide to deviate and personalize your model yourself. This would either mean via your own unlabeled training data on your device or via some sort of training set schedule that you do yourself. But this would be the user controlling the machine learning instead of the other way around. So imagine yourself if you could use actual search algorithms that you decided to train yourself. Maybe we wouldn't end up in a YouTube radicalization loop. <laughs> So we looked, at all, we looked at the different compositional elements, right? The essences, we, the, the, the ones that we talked about today, right, were application and data and identity. And so it's just a reminder of like, this is the architecture that we propose today um, to just give you a picture of what things could look like. Now, the question is, okay, well, how are we gonna actually get there? What are some next steps that we can actually make? Catherine? <laughs> well, I say, let's take a look at where things are at now. For identity, if you're not already familiar with it, the W3C has provided the DID already set of standards and protocols. And some fellow thought workers of ours are actually implementing this as a proof of concept right now for the Singapore government, who would like to move towards more privacy first, ways of identification for their residents online. So they're actually implementing DIDs at the Singapore government, and if you're a Singapore resident, you should presumably be able to apply and get one to navigate online. But if you're not there yet, you could also look at federated identity services and see all of the kind of hype around zero trust architecture and move to something like an open ID protocol. And then, in the application services space, right, when you're thinking about decoupling and decentralizing application, there are some exciting emerging technologies coming there as well. First and foremost, I want to remind everyone, or, or if you haven't heard of Solid and Pods, it's a, a new venture by Tim Berners-Lee, who is the founder of the web. So his team at Interrupt, they're developing the standard Solid, and they're building it on other existing W3C standards, and they're finding standards that would allow one to decentralize applications from the data ownership, which they call pods, personal data, uh, data uh, per, what is it, uh, personal online data stores. And um, so from, this is a very web-centric, decentralized uh, application architecture. So you'll see them building things on HTTP and uh, web ACLs and web ID. 
Now remember, with decentralized applications, right, it's very important that we have the standards in place so that the applications can communicate with each other. So one example here that we put on here is schema.org. And schema.org is a, uh, a, a place where you can find existing standards maybe in your industry. Or if you don't find one from your industry, then you could also propose new standards for industry as well. The other the one that we have wanted to put out here was Local First. So Local First is a 2019 initiative. It was started by a research community called Ink and Switch in Germany. And for them, they're looking at what are the principles in, for software design that allow for local first um, software applications. And so what, for them, they're also thinking privacy first and ownership in the hands of the users. So this is coming from the academic community, but um, a lot of great research um, that, that they put, put, put there. And one of the things that they're also uh, talking about and looking to promote more is a 2011 published data structure concept called CRDT, or conflict-free replicated data types. Now, you know, think about these data types like you might think about hash maps or links, but fundamentally CRDTs are from the ground up, supporting privacy first in that they are multi-user and collaborative ways of um, thinking about your data structures. And we could even take it further and do local only. So you can't be subpoenaed for data you don't hold. I say this in America with good reason right now. <laughs> I repeat, you cannot be subpoenaed for data that you don't hold. So think long and hard about the data that you do hold and the decisions that you're making with that. If you choose local only data, or if you choose to make sure that the data is only ever decrypted on a user device, you're potentially protecting lots of people. There's also peer to peer. We heard about Groove, and Namisha, I think it's time to bring Groove back. Yes, I think so. <laughs> well, the next generation, whatever that's gonna be, I think with this great hive mind here with a lot of innovation, who knows what would actually come to forth as we move forward on this. Um, and then, but when we think about access, think, think about leveraging the technologies that might exist today where we decouple access from data. Now here are a sampling of a few that we're putting forth and reminding people that exist today, right? So Signal Protocol, it's an open source protocol for messaging used by Signal and WhatsApp and Google and others. But at the end of the day, what's happening there is your messages, right? They are end-to-end -end encrypted, and so once again there too, you, the access to the underlying message is decoupled from those who uh, are owning the data transport or the data storage of those messages. Um, another class of things around access, right? We could put Vault, 1Password, HSM. These are all types of things that will allow you to decouple the, uh, the storage of secrets from the storage of data. All of these things are allowing you to decouple and tease things apart that can then eventually lead us to decentralization. The last one I put here on this list was OPA, Open Policy Agent, right? That's an open source um, uh, 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 thing that people can use where as software developers, you don't need to tightly couple your access control business logic with your code itself, right? Keep your access policies separated out of your application code logic. Um, that's gonna then also not only allow for better design in some ways, but also for decentralization of access, which we don't really have much of today at all, but it steps towards it. And finally, if you're working in machine learning or if you're thinking of analytics, see if you can apply it in a federated or distributed manner. So the easy one, or the easier one, is federated learning and analytics, of which there's many helper libraries for. The field that I worked in is encrypted distributed learning which is a multi-party way of doing encrypted learning. So if you wanna take a look at that, we have an open source library for that as well, and it uses secure multi-party computation, which is a subfield of cryptography where you never actually have to decrypt the data to process or work on it. So this is uh, TF encrypted and a few other libraries that are available for this. 
And if that wasn't enough, we wanted to give you even more tactical steps that you can take, right? So here are some uh, very quick examples. In the realm of identity, seriously, folks, if today you're working in an organization where you're asking your users to create yet another password, let's see, see if you can make the case, right, where now you're able to actually, instead of yet another password for your own users to create and, and, and manage, can they instead, can you instead use federated identities, single sign-on? And then if better yet, see if you can use any sort of decentralized identities like DIDs and digital wallets. In the realm of application services, you know, think about can you make your applications interoperable? Can you use standards? If your uh, business isn't using that today, can you make the business case for it? Right? Be a leader in your industry by proposing standards that may not exist for your industry today. And then in the realm of storage, today we have user data coupled with business data. Right? Can you detangle that? So instead of, for instance, your users' names or things like that spread throughout all of your microservices, Right? Can that instead be in a single place that is a lot more protected and um, can actually support GDPR in a much more native way? Um, and then uh, the other thing is make your data portable. Right? That's also going to go a long way. Finally, in the realm of access, right, one thing we wanted to point out here is, uh, you know, if you're, uh, oh, oops, sorry. Did I? Okay. Yeah. So uh, for access, right, check your assumptions that you have today. Can you build in measures today that will automatically expire access after a period of time? You know, once granted does not, always, does not need to mean always granted, right? And it doesn't have to be all or no, nothing. There might be granularity that you can provide for your access. Three final tips. Talk with your users. Does their mental model match your mental model of how the data is actually stored? Ask them how they'd like their data stored. Ask them how they'd like to grant access. Document your lineage and your consent workflows. If you don't know where the data is coming from, you can't detangle it. And finally, GDPR is a great set of rules for everybody. Actually read the rights there. Right to deletion, right to access, right to removal, right to expiration, right to opt out of automated processing, right to data portability. The European government will come eventually for all of these rights. So if you're ahead of the game, maybe you can actually both be prepared and also potentially put the users back at the center. And, and there's right to change the narrative, right, Catherine? <laughs> exactly. You have that right. Yes. So if the user was back at the center and the user could actually control their data, control access, think about how they'd like their data to be used, and do those procedures themselves. And once the user is truly back at the center, it resets our industry to build on top of it, right? Imagine supporting the needs of communities and groups of users so that on top of that, it's built on top of a truly user-centric foundation. And if we have that, then communities, cities, nations, states could actually ask users to donate their data. We could potentially think about climate change at a community or an intragovernmental or governmental level with data supported from users all across the world. The users, the communities, the organizations, the nations, and expand that vision to the global landscape. You'll then find a world where human-centric architecture is at the heart. Then technology is not then fundamentally rooted in serving us, right? It's, I mean, sorry, technology is fundamentally rooted in serving us, right? Not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you.